So we are an interdisciplinary team and you see for EPFL or for a technical institution, a slightly woman dominated uh, group. Uh, we work actually on the transitions of urban systems uh, towards sustainability. And you will hear in the course of the lecture a little bit how we approach it and then what are the methods and the theories that we used to look into that. A few key messages, what would I like to look into? So the first thing is that I would say the energy transition is not the energy transition. There is not something that we can say, wow, this is how the energy transition will work and these are the key elements of it, but, but it is more likely to be something that is linking social and technical systems. And without that linkage between the, the two systems and not understanding them, we are not potentially not likely to really be successful in the energy transition itself. And then the function of housing and the functions that housing can fulfill could be a relevant cornerstone for the transition. I would like to inspire you to think maybe some more along these lines. But what is the energy transition? So when you think of the energy transition, you can find a lot of different elements, for example, 100% renewable energy regions in Germany, uh, in, in uh, Canton of Vaux, they are saying Avou de Jouer. They try to bring people together to engage in that. Their local um, markets in Switzerland. There is a, a vision that people are putting forward. There's crowdfunding. And then, if you look a little bit deeper, there is one thing that we are seeing is that the regional level is becoming more and more important. So, model and energy regions have really the opportunity to revolutionize the energy turn. There is kind of this uh, vision that in 2020, this was a, a, a few uh, years ago, the energy region wanted to be uh, self-sufficient. And they were trying to, to see, is this actually possible at the regional level? Can we as a region become self-sufficient and what will be required to do so? However, what we are confronting with is that we have technological, we have institutional and social lock-ins, I would say. Technologically, in the sense also, if we even look at uh, housing renovation or renovation of houses, obviously it is related to first uh, uh, technologies that are available where well, we have them now, then institutional in a sense, do we have the right incentives, but social, are the people at the age, at, at the part of their life where they really want to engage into spending money for renovating the house? If there's a person or an old couple living in a house and they are 80 years old and they should renovate it, they will not do so. So this is kind of a lock-in that I will talk about. Then what we're also seeing that even if we have all the technical innovations, they are not sufficient for the transition. So we need to include and I would say specifically the co-evolution of the social and the technical systems. How do they work together? How do they evolve together over time? Because we have diversity of technologies which emerge at different spaces and paces and different actors who have different interests. So we need to dig into that. So maybe just to get on the same page, I assume that you have uh, seen this figure quite some time. So. If we think of the energy transition, we can think of a pre-development phase of any transition process actually, a takeoff phase, an acceleration phase, and a potential stabilization phase in the future. And what I suggest to you is that we need a different set of knowledges in order to, to reach that final stage. So on the one hand, we need to figure out where is it that we're going. And th that is typically now in the energy transition given or dictated or proposed, let's say, by the national government. We have the energy strategy uh, Switzerland, where we know exactly what is the share of energies that are going to be pursued in the future. I will not show the numbers how we are not fulfilling it, but so kind of, uh, there is kind of a, a, the goal that we have. Then we need system knowledge. This is in the pre-development space as phase and going through the whole transition, namely what are actually the relevant processes, flows, actor, institutions, and the regulatory mechanisms, trying to figure out how the system really works, what are the feedback loops to understand the system. And then finally, one key aspect that, that is dearest to my heart, and I will say a few more words about that afterwards, the transformative knowledge. Once we know how everything works, we know where we want to go to. What are the drivers and what are the barriers of change? How can we really reach that future state and uh, in, in an, in other contexts, I would look, like to talk about the resilience of the transition. Are we going to reach the state that we have been envisioning? In that discussion, there is a very famous model put forward by some colleagues from the Netherlands who say, okay, let's look at 
niches, pioneers, new innovations, and I would put it forward beyond technological innovations, also social innovations. And we have these our pioneers down here trying to innovate the system. We have, however, our dominant social technical energy regime, which is composed of several components, markets, technology, politics, culture, and we have the social technical landscape. So this is the context that is influencing our system. So if you would say that the energy region might be there in our social, dominant social technical regime, we have kind of the dictations or we have kind of the goals of the nation. We have also the SDG goals trying to influence the, that system to move into a new energy system. And we have the pioneers who feed in the new technologies, who feed in their new innovations to also support that process. So when we look at these different elements, there are kind of three major questions that I would like to address in, in the coming something like uh, 30 minutes. So which are the factors that affected the energy transition if we look back? So I will take really the example of two uh, forward moving Austrian energy regions. So as I was in Austria, then we want to look into how might a potential future energy system look like? How do people envision a future energy system? And which aspects might be relevant to them? And then dig a little bit deeper into how can a transition path be conceived? And what role do the technical and the social systems play within that? So I will be showing you some examples of these two study areas and they are two very distinct ones. So Ökönegiland Güssing, you might have heard of it, it's a very pioneer region, it was very poor when it started pioneering in 1990. They had a huge amount of biomass, but a high unemployment rate and migration. And the Energy region Weizgleisdorf, where they were really central and they had two mayors pushing it forward. So they had a lot of energy technologies and they, were, they wanted to move into the new direction. These two energy regions actually took two very distinct pathways. The Ökönegi land was fostering mostly energy technology. So they were really trying to put forward and to develop new energy technologies. They had the European Center for Energy Research where people from PSI here from Switzerland came. So it was kind of rather international. So people from further far. And they were trying to develop new technologies and to involve the community through associations, through, through creating heating, district heating systems where people could get free, uh, uh, free um, sign in free for the being connected to the pipes. And then afterwards moving forward into that direction. The Energie on Weiz Gleisdorf was completely different. So they were saying, we have to show lighthouse projects. So kind of Germany house, solar trees and fueling stations and so on to, to show how, how can the energy region really happen. And when I was teaching in that area, actually, when you enter to the energy region, there's a big thing saying, you're entering now the energy region. So I had to ask my students, who is from Weizgleisdorf? And I don't know, 20 or 30 people raised their hand. And then I said, do you know that you're an energy region? They looked at me, no, I had no idea. I said, okay, good. So far for these projects then and how they were received. So to approach the whole uh, system, we, we used methods from social and uh, and material flow and energy flow sciences. So at the level of the social uh, methods, we used first expert interviews to understand how the transition process worked. We coupled that with an energy flow analysis over time. And then we depicted how the transition process came about and validated it in a transdisciplinary process with the actors. Out of these two strands, also a household survey emerged which would fulfill the data requirements for a behavioral model and for a dynamic energy demand model. These then were computed together in order to, to be able to simulate different scenarios, visions and policies put forward by the community. So let me show you some results of, for the first question. What you see here is uh, on the one hand in black, uh, in, in green, sorry, the length of the district heating grid. So this was really built early when they started their vision. Then the customers connected to the grid. And what you can see is slightly time delayed, the energy production, you, and where, which was using these grids and the use of biomass resources. We identified a series of milestones. First kind of visionary milestones where the ideas of the people came together and they 
were kind of putting forward something. And this is like an energy charge out there. Institutional milestones were when something became even more clear and they can permanent and binding agreements like the foundation of the Öko Land. So this is really something very official. Then physical um, milestones is when something was built and external institutional here was important for uh, Austria when they joined the EU. So when we look at, at the process over time, what we can see is that first there was a vision, then they built something, then they joined the EU, they got access to money, then they institutionalized, then they built something and so on. So we have a deep interaction between visionary milestones, institutional milestones and physical milestones. The second thing that you can see here is that there is a time delay. So about what we would say now as, as an environmental scientist, when can I measure something? So you put forward your vision and 10 years later, I can really measure something that is significantly um, important for this energy region. However, what you can see that self-sufficiently increased from 26% only to 53%. This is now for Ekoenergieland in the energy region by Skleistov, increased from 18% to 26% in the same uh, uh, period of time. So what you can see here is if the energy, uh, the energy region really develops uh, technologies, puts technologies forward and has a clear vision on that, there is a really a significant increase and a significant uh, push for the use also of renewables. I am sharing with you that the region went bankrupt, but this is another question and another talk. The second question, how might a potential future energy system look like? Mm, here we were together with um, a group of people initiated by the local energy supplier and the energy region to develop scenarios for the, the future energy system. What we did, we did a huge participatory process where we asked the people how and where would they want to decide themselves for and how is their engagement. And what we try to do is actually not say, yeah, we're going to become 100% renewable, but how would each of these scenarios of different degrees of renewable energy then dripple down to different areas of their life? So regarding resource use, regarding the living, regarding the working landscape and obviously energy supply. And then we had all the population voting on it for the preferred and not preferred scenario. And um, what you can see here first, the votes were what do you wish for and what, how likely is something to occur. And this is in the region for the region flourishes is the most energy self-sufficient down to if nothing happens, status quo. And obviously people desire that there's a high degree of energy self-sufficiency. There's really a flourishing of the region in, that, uh, in this perspective. But if you start seeing what they think is likely, you see that the likeliness of something to happen is much lower, also in their perspective. We followed up with an interview asking them, well, so where do you like to engage yourselves in and so on? And it started um, figuring at the end that, for example, they were not at all interested in engaging themselves in mobility issues. They were likely to do something in housing, but not really. So, so there's really this, this willingness also to engage affects obviously the likenessness of the outcome of the process. So if we look now, how can a transition path be conceived and what role do social and te technical systems play therein? Let's take a look a little bit into housing, and this is maybe closer to what Arno is, is doing. So we developed some scenarios for regional energy demand, some bottom-up scenarios, where we looked at different envelope renovation rates, legislative standards, heating technologies, at the level of uh, different typologies of buildings. And we had extremely good data from the Stati statistical office in Austria. And we compared that with the potential of regional supply of renewable energies trying to figure out what is the technical maximum, what is it if we do exclude competing uses, uh, spatial accessibility, and so on. Let me share with you a few of the examples. So this is kind of a, a very easy net local model that we developed, and uh, we positioned the different houses, especially in, in, in the area. This is now for Weizgleisdorf, and you could play around with the different amount of uh, 
of uh, variables. So this is what we used also for stakeholder involvement. And uh, we varied renovation rate, we varied the degree of energy efficiency put forward by law for renovation and for new buildings. And the outcome you can see to the right is the amount of buildings with a certain amount of energy uh, consumption. And let me bring a few uh, of the results in this regard. So in the business as usual scenario, we have a renovation rate of 0.8%, very similar to, to what we have actually in Switzerland. And these are the energy standards that were um, at the time of the simulation, the current ones. And uh, well, you can see here the distribution of the buildings. It's mostly single family houses in that area and the kilowatt hours per square meter in year consumed by them. If we start increasing the renovation rate, we see that the tail slightly moves everything to, to the left. So we have less uh, inefficient houses. If we move to the legislative standards discussed at that uh, time, and we keep the renovation rate upright, obviously we have a, a bigger tail and we have people moving more to energy efficient houses. And obviously if we assume that everything is improving, it, it goes, uh, has a very perfect shape. Mm. What we can see is that at the end of the simulation process, even with the current business as usual scenarios, energy consumption reduces by 40%. Already without doing any increasing in renovation rate, any increase in energy standards. Obviously, the, if we increase the energy standards, we end up with less consumption per year in the year 2050. However, we do not include whether the renovation rate will decrease if they are increasing reno, uh, energy standards. So it might be that we end up, for example, with 0 0.6 or 0 0.4%. If we start looking at the cumulative energy demand, we see that there is a small trade-off between increasing the renovation rate. So we have a, a lower cumulative energy demand over time than if we increase the energy standards. Now, we can think, okay, if we want to reduce energy consumption over this whole period of time, and we think of the cumulative energy consumption, we might want to increase the renovation rate. However, if you think we want to have a lower end state, we might want to end up with a building stock, which is more energy efficient, but take consider a lower renovation rate in this respect. I think this might be a trade-off. We, we, we need also to discuss potentially in Switzerland to figure out what are the different elements that we want to consider. And in this, uh, also we looked at the different uh, amounts of energy carriers that are being used and uh, obviously oil will decrease. We have a slight increase in, in wood because uh, it was used as a, for compensating for oil. And we have a constant amount of energy consumption. This is for the business as usual scenario. What we found when looking at how could it be fulfilled with the local energy demand local energy produced, we find that with PV, we need to include even parts of the facades of the buildings in order to be able to supply the energy demand here. It becomes even worse if we have increasing heating pumps uh, there. So then, then we need even more PV production. Here, the PV production is very low in the business as usual scenario, but even if we aim at all the roofs having to produce a PV, we will not be able to fulfill it if we do not include the facades. Um, let's move to the to the next part, and uh, I want to share with you an idea that that I have been playing around with a lot: the idea of the tipping points, typically used in in ecological systems, and we can try to reconceptualize them in this context. So, let's. Put it in a very simple way, if we have our current energy system with our old habits, it means also old innovations, old infrastructure, old um, uh, institutions, we are going to stay with our non-sustainable energy system. So we are developing our innovations. However, we need to surpass uh, the tipping point. That means we need to be able to go over a threshold where you might have a non-linear change or non-linear change process that drives you to a significantly different qualitative state of the energy system. And that can has to be done with linkages in the social system, in the technological system, and potentially in the ecological one. What we have been finding when we analyze 
these transition processes is that actually that if you start disentangling these different um, tipping points and these different curves, that they are not all at the same time. They, they are the tipping point for social systems might be earlier than the one for the technical system and the feedback at the, in the environmental system might be even delayed so we are we we are thinking of that how our new sustainable energy system should look like we have to think of disentangled potential tipping points in different phases and elements of the system itself so having said that let's look now how might we approach these tipping points? So we looked into the intended use of potential energy technologies. And here what we can see is that housing technologies are much more likely to be taken up than technologies in the area of mobility. This might have changed a little bit, it's kind of a few years old. So now maybe in mobility, there's a higher propensity. And the other thing that we can observe is that for example, heat pumps or newer technologies, the intended use of having them or using them is even lower. I will come now into the decision process and try to explain also how, how this might come about. Now, this is the intended use. Then what do people really do? When analyzing the decision-making process in detail, we find that after a trigger, we have an orientation phase of the people, outcome being, the highest preferred energy standard. They start getting in planning and implementation. This is in what they select and then they evaluate. By and large, from the orientation process until the planning and implementation process, the energy standard decreases. So the energy standard implemented at the end is lower than the one that they wanted in the beginning. By and large, I, I will not put the fault on anyone, uh, do the recommendation of experts. So we started digging a little bit deeper into that and first analyzing, well, okay, let's go even one step behind. What are the triggers? And these are only the triggers between energy efficient versus standard innovation. This is now a recent study that we did in, in a, a big region in Bavaria. So if people have to work on the maintenance of the envelope, they say, okay, let's go ahead and let's do the whole energy efficient uh, renovation. If the recommendation, the experts recommend them to do so, they will be also more energy efficient. If their network, the social network recommends them to do so, they're also likely to do that. And we are finding this actually also for Switzerland for the installation of PV for, for buying uh, electromobility. So I'm not completely ready with these uh, results. I cannot present them to you yet, but that, that's really a, a key point. The network and the experts tend to play an, a crucial role in the adoption of new technologies. Also personal interest, and obviously here in this case, if they get funding. So from this, we would assume, wow, energy efficient renovation. So they are installing all new technologies or efficient technologies, but we are far from doing that. So if we, think of and what have been people thinking about in the orientation phase what did they implement it and we can see that they implement by and large the typical technologies traditional technologies and they do not move into the next step namely into solar heat into pvs into heat pumps or new type of ventilation systems so we find here also a problem that even the people who are aiming at implementing energy efficient measures end up with something that is not the newest type of technologies that we would have thought that they might have wanted to use. We try to dig now in a survey a little bit deeper into what uh, is it that people that drives the people to change or not. So the current decision to renovate and to renovate more energy efficient is driven first by the expert recommendation in, in both directions, in the positive one, in the negative one. By and large, uh, people who are a little bit more mature, maybe have higher budget, they um, also are influences positively the decision 
to renovate at a more energy efficient level, as well as their knowledge of the technology and their attitude. And obviously, the energy efficiency level depends whether you're building or you're renovating. Now, if we go into the evaluation period, so we ask, well, so how did you perceive or how important was different the renovation for you? So interesting enough, the highest satisfaction was for comfort in their new house. And this is for, for actually all of the people who renovated independently of the, the degree of renovation, followed by energy use and maybe costs. Yeah, continuous costs. Actually, 76% of the people would implement the same degree of energy efficiency than they had implemented. Only 22% would say, mm, maybe I should have maybe insisted, I would have uh, stayed with my uh, with a higher energy uh, degree and 2.1% would have implemented a lower one. Now, if we look into what they recommended to their friends, and we ask the question on purpose, by and large, I think a large amount, more than 50% of the people would recommend to their friends a higher energy standard than the one that they implemented themselves. I found this completely ridiculous. This is, I find it so, so interesting that I always keep uh, saying, okay, wow. 26% uh, say, yeah, you have the standard that I have, you should use that and, and so on. So. The, this for me is, is a striking argument, but it also can show because we can also see that there is a correlation between the energy standard recommended and the, the social network. And this is actually, again, the, the study of Austria. So we can see here it's only correlation. So it, it, if you put it into the whole regression, it is not significant. But seeing also the results that we are getting now in, um, in Germany and in Switzerland, that first study also shows, okay, there is something emerging in the social network. And if I start recommending to my, uh, to my neighbors and to my friends a higher energy standard, and this starts to become a relevant point in my decision-making process, then the probability might be high that we might get into a sustainable state in the future. Actually here also, um, what we find in, in Switzerland study that the neighboring effect is significant and is very important, mostly for the installation of PV. So let's look into a second aspect that I wanted to share with you, and that is uh, the tenants view. So tenants in Switzerland at least can play a very important role if their demand for sustainable housing or for energy uh, efficient housing becomes prominent. And also if their probability of moving maybe to a smaller apartment over time, when the household size decreases, if that becomes prominent, then also this might contribute or make a significant contribution to um, the energy transition. So together with uh, Anna Pagani, we are looking into what are the different aspects that might motivate tenants to move if their household size decreases. Let me just share with you that the, when they are asked whether sustainability plays a role in the household decision, it is uh, not a high, does not play a high role for the decision making process. So when we look at that, we obviously the high satisfaction with their current dwelling plays an important role. Then some people would like to move to a larger dwelling and uh, look, location plays a key role as well as a cheap rent. So this is why they would not move if the household size decreases. And these are actually a study that we did with uh, ABZ in Zürich with Genossenschaften in SHL in, uh, in the area here of the Romandie and with uh, tenants of Swiss Mobilier. So typically, even in these Genossenschaften, the people try to, the cooperative people try really to look that they they foster the mobility of, of elderly. So, so even, even there, the willingness to move is not very high. And then even if they were willing to do so, what could be then a barrier? So let's assume that they really want to move. Then it's the location part. So kind of the amenities that are close by that they might not find a dwelling that satisfies their needs and preferences. And obviously the financial reasons that I mentioned before. and uh, the high satisfaction with the current dwelling. So by looking into that, we started questioning ourselves, well, if actually 
they are not interested in sustainability characteristics. They really have a different set of elements that they consider to be important. So what is it that we could potentially propose to them in order that people would move? And we started thinking about functions of the dwelling, functions of housing, instead of housing characteristics. And thereby we can think of a, a function, of a housing function, as something that tells us what is the object for, what does the object do, and what, it, what is the behavior that is likely to happen given a certain structure. And, uh, and together with Anna, or we developed kind of nine different functions, and I want to share a few of them with you. So one is, for example, shelter. If you consider housing, your apartment to be a shelter, a refugee, a fortress, so where you can go home to rest, permanence, where you feel kind of when you belong, that you're rooted in production consumption, that you are kind of just able to perform your own activities, eating, laundering, companionship, but it might not be that relevant as, 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 a, as a rooting feeling, then a status symbol. I want to really show what I have. I can exhibit myself much better and self-representation so it's kind of satisfaction of my aspirations. When I try to figure out whether these functions might lead to an increase or decrease in uh, the propensity to move in case that also your household might shrink. Mm. And here you see the ranked odds ratio in a multinomial regression, predicting the category willing to move with reference of the category not willing to move. And what you can see is that if I'm in the mode of production consumption and self-representation, I'm more likely to move. Whereas if I perceive that it is a permanent place for me, it is a, it is a status symbol, I'm less likely to move. So the question could be here, can we, and obviously income plays a role. So uh, the question, can we use kind of these functions to design houses, to design apartments in such a way that we might be able to fulfill the needs of the different people while still including some ecological and uh, um, sustainability elements into the housing itself. So by putting these elements into the function, including it into the function, it might be easier to support people in taking the decision to move or not to move. So let me summarize and conclude. So we are actually in the midst of the energy transition and we could see that there's a co-evolution between the social, the technical uh, and the technical systems. And there we have really this visionary and institutional milestones typically preceding physical ones. And they have been finding that also in, uh, in different regions in, in Germany and in Switzerland. So there is a, a trade-off between this maybe faster transition with maybe increasing renovation rate and having a stock of less energy efficient houses with the stock of higher energy efficient houses. What we have been observing is this low uptake of energy efficient technologies as individual level. And I honestly, to think this is also true for Switzerland, even though we have not uh, looked into depth in there, but uh, everything that I see, and the, if I even talk with experts now, not necessarily architects, but uh, people, for example, supplying also uh, heating systems, the main recommendation they make, take an oil heating now because tomorrow you will have to implement the heating pump. So this might not be the slogan to use, but this is what we are all confronted with if we want to engage in that transition. And uh, there is really a um, key role of experts to play also of, of architects, um, the role of design versus energy efficiency or with energy efficiency and the different triggers. And uh, what we also see if we go now to the tenant level, there is a low willingness to reduce the housing size. There's a low willingness to engage in houses which are more sustainable and maybe housing functions can lead us or can be used as a tool to move towards more social, culturally, and environmentally sustainable housing, they might be supportive on that. And just to finish up, so 
I said we are maybe there is not the transition. So I said before with the tipping points, there is a social element, a technical element, maybe even ecological aspects. But uh, in addition, we can think of these uh, vision uh, transition steps to have kind of maybe a first transition path. We can disentangle them with first goals that have been achieved and then a renewed vision coming up with a second transition pathway. So if we think of that in, in this way, we can say, wow, if we are able to stabilize in the middle of the point, and then it's again a point of no return back, then we can engage into the second part of the transition. And maybe this is a way to go forward and to, to try to disentangle the different transition pathways over time. And maybe some open questions. How to get beyond infrastructure? Is infrastructure is essential, but how can we be, get beyond it? What are the boundary conditions and triggers needed? Can we co-design technologies and gadgets to support us to that? And uh, how to better consider typology for our consumers regarding, for example, the different housing functions? Are we confronted at the end, you know, if we move into this direction with some type of rebound effect? With that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Claudia. A virtual applause uh, for this um, very engaging and fascinating talk. And now we have a, a round of questions um, to break the ice. I obviously, I noted down a lot of questions, so maybe I, I go first. <laughs> I saw you writing down, wow. <laughs> if, that, if that's okay. I mean, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of links to, to our work where, I mean, even though, I mean, yes, we come from building perspective, but we also look into those technical systems. I very much like this idea of the of the tipping point. And I think we have just observed the tipping point with respect to electric mobility in the past years. I don't know if you if share if you share that impression. All of a sudden it's flipping and people buy uh, increasingly electric, electric vehicles, first from like first movers such as Tesla. And now I just read that VW is is taking the lead on that. So, so where do we stand? What is your impression? Where do we stand with buildings? I mean, obviously buying a car is just a product, right? You're placing a product that is rather short-term and it's an easy decision to make. But this, mm -hmm. this tipping point, what, what would you say is the, what are the essential ingredients and where do we stand with respect to buildings? Actually, it's, it's, it's a very good question. And uh, uh, there is one, uh, one paper that came out recently that says, well, if 25% have been in, in that point, they, they, they will move ahead. I think the problem of buildings, I see it much more difficult than with electromobility because it, it relates to, to several aspects. And here I would say even overlaying aspects that have to co-occur. So you have on the one hand, your building has to be old enough. Then you need to be at the right stage of your development age as a family, for example. And then you need to have a significant amount of money to, to, to invest. So only if these three elements come together Mm -hmm. you might get into renovation. This is for individual housing. Uh, I do think that this is why, even though buildings are old, they, they have not been able to move into that direction. This is kind of my, one of my key hypotheses in that respect, because if the other two components do not apply, then no one will engage in renovation. This is why the renovation rate is, is rather slow. Now for corporate buildings, I think it's even more difficult. And I think there, we might be standing in the pre-development phase. I don't think we, we have reached a tipping point there, but it will be reached in the sense when it becomes a marketing element. The moment that it becomes a market marketing element to, to, to renovate old buildings, then I think the, the investment will, will take place. I think before it is rather difficult to do so. We, we also have done some surveys on that and it's not, not really easy. Then they, they have their strategy group for energy self-sufficiency, but the, the, the probability that they implement their ideas is sometimes rather low. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, a second aspect, even we investigated um, a building of Mobilier here, here close by, uh, all energy self-sufficient super duper building. People don't like to live there. So people move out in very short periods of time. And, and so, so it, it's very difficult actually. I think mm -hmm. they're, they're the tipping point we are far from reaching it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have the impression that in the in the past years on the corporate side, with this wake of corporate social responsibility and also kind of this, mm -hmm. this uh, I'm not calling it greenwashing, but with, with get, getting a green appearance, there has been a, quite a shift. Sometimes I, I would agree it's a little bit unreflected in a sense uh, that it's it, it doesn't seem to be that coordinated, but at least to get this kind of um, green appearance, there's something happening in, in a mindset. But for individual, mm -hmm. I would agree it's, it's very difficult. 
I've, I, before I, I shoot my next question, I hand over to Paolo, who also raised hand. Uh, thank you, Arno. Uh, very nice and interesting presentation, Claudia. Uh, in relation to the question that was posed by, by Arno, uh, I have an additional element that uh, uh, I would eventually like to add to your list of the three elements that can make the tipping point. Mm -hmm. I have the feeling, or at least I, for, for some time I was convinced that in Switzerland particularly, there is an additional element that can play a role. How people are concerned about the environment. You know, what is their mm -hmm. level of sensitivity mm -hmm. with respect to the environment? Even if it's not uh, financially convenient, even if it's not uh, technically immediately feasible, they do it for the sake of doing for the benefit of the environment. Did you investigate this uh, element? Uh, do you think it plays a role? Or is it my simple perception of somebody coming from Italy, from a different country, a different uh, mindset, coming into a country in which uh, people don't throw anything on the floor and so on, or at least the majority, not everybody? Great. Thank you very much, Paolo, for this question. Super pertinent. Uh, actually, now, with respect to, to the studies in, in Austria that we showed, we inquired into that, but it, it did not show significant uh, in these regressions. However, I can say that for um, electromobility, can come back to that, a study that we're doing in the canton of Vaux currently, it is extremely important. It's the major, uh, the first and utmost uh, factor of why they engage in buying electromobility is environmental concerns. Then we have done studies on pro-environmental behaviors and their kind of the feeling green, not, not the, you know, partly the attitude, but mostly feeling green, the perception that I'm being green if I behave in this and this way uh, is a prominent driver for lighthouse behaviors, for behaviors that the other sees that I'm doing. So it goes into greenwashing a little bit. <laughs> so, the, so, so we investigated kind of day-to-day -day behaviors and so not investment behaviors yet, but they're typically the lighthouse behaviors, what everyone can observe what I'm doing, there they are as green as they can be, and they show off and the, that the, the green perception then motivates them to do so. For other behaviors, it's not that prominent, but, but it's an extremely important point and we are focusing on that and also on the, the social network also being green or not being green. So we're trying to figure out whether the social network there plays an important role, if I, if I relate to them, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Russell, you had a question? Yeah, um, Claudia, thanks very much for the, the presentation. There was, there was some interesting numbers in there. Um, one, of the, one of the things that perhaps is hitting architecture more strongly now is the question of energy storage. And um, it, it ties into Arno's question a little bit because of the idea of the, the networked automobile, you know, plugging the automobile back into the, the grid as a, a storage device. But over the, the last decade, we've seen radical changes in electrical storage potential and, and several appliances that are able to be installed um, as a unit into an individual home, mm -hmm. either in a networked systematic way or uh, in, in a larger system. Um, how does that play into your figures and, and how does that affect your kind of uh, long range forecasts? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, th thanks a lot for that. So we have actually one PhD student, uh, Matteo Varsanti, who is now really engaged also in, in simulating different scenarios for this uh, use of this DSM and how it can influence the flexibility mostly of, of the energy system. So there, I think the, the key point uh, is not necessarily to reduce energy consumption. This is not necessarily the concern, but to, to reduce the peaks and to, and to try to level them out due to different um, aspects that, that people want to, to engage in. So we are trying now, we are making a discrete choice experiment with uh, different stakeholders in order to better understand when are they engaging into that, how and at which time during the day are they willing to give up privacy in order to, to move forward to, to support these, these flexibility. So there I don't have any concrete uh, results now, so this is ongoing. We did a, a workshop together with Romand Energy and uh, they were trying to advertise smart meters for two different stakeholders. And by and large, the people who came to the workshop, I think, wow, they knew more about energy systems than I did. So they're really kind of these 
these in German you would say Tüftler, you know, these guys who know everything, who are engaged, who do it themselves, and and super kind of uh, eloquent, even elderly women who are uh, fight for the good. So you have typically the front runners who are energy affined, who love technology. Those people come to the workshops. Those people also engage in these uh, app devices and so on. The effect on energy consumption in the beginning can be up to 10%, actually really significantly reducing it if you have a smart meter and the app. What they have been finding in this long term, it is only 2 to 5%, so it's not higher than that. So even if people uh, engage in that, uh, it levels out and after one year you end up with 2 to 5% and it's not a lot actually. I, I find this kind of uh, a little bit of frustrating. And the reasoning being too false. And what is interesting, a study in the UK showed there are two types of groups of people. And this is where I think also the tipping point concept. Of, yeah, maybe we have to talk a lot, a lot about that. So you have the people, we change for good, and it's good this way. And we have the guy, I know now what consumes energy and I don't care. And this kind of, and this is extra excerpts of individual interviews that they did. So if you have these two distinct and very different groups of people, how can we, I mean, this one's the, the innovative ones, well, no problem. They're, they're easy to, to buy in and they, they are willing to contribute. They will buy the electric car, they will put in a smart meter. But what do we do with the others? Those who don't care, how can we embark them? What, is the, what are their barriers and what are their innovation ideas? I, I think this is a key question that we have to tackle somehow. Yes, thank you. Additional questions? Otherwise, I would follow up on, on that one. And I was wondering, you, you mentioned that um, if, if people ask the local installer what they should do, uh, he or she says, okay, let's buy another oil heating system. And, and obviously, very much of those decisions are connected to investment cost. But we have sufficient studies that, that show, yes, on, on a life cycle perspective, you would have for example, a heat pump, yeah, even if you're not taking into account uncertainty of energy price and all that, a heat pump and, and solar modules on a life cycle perspective are the cheapest way of actually getting your heat and generating your electricity. Mm -hmm. I was always wondering how can we ever achieve that people go away from this investment cost perspective towards a life cycle perspective? And of course, age of people is, a, is, a, is an element. We did a study in Tenet in the Engadin where the, the owner of one house approached us and said, look, I'm 65. I will live for 10 more years. I'm not retrofitting anything. I will be dead. Right? So how, how can we move towards this? Life? How, how would it be possible to do it? show people, yes, even from an economic point of view, this is the cheapest thing you can do over a life cycle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there any, uh, do you, did you have any experiences or did you come across anything? Yeah, well, you're, you're asking the, the question probably dearest to my heart. <clears throat> I can only say from my personal experience, we live in a house where we have different owners of, of different apartments and uh, we had to redo the, um, the ceiling, kind of the, uh, sorry, the, the dach. Um, and then uh, we were kind of asking our co-owners, let's put PV there. I had a super offer. I had, I had negotiated a great offer. There was still everything upright. And the owner of two apartments, an economist, economist said, no, I'm not investing into these green ideas. And I said, but you're not investing into the greenness. You have a payoff. You know, you see here the payoff. Here, you see, this is what it costs. This is what it costs without PV. It's, just, you know, 10,000 more or something like that, or 20 more, whatever, you will get a payoff. It was impossible to convince her. Mm -hmm. I made Excel calculations. I made everything I could. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so honestly, I have no idea. There is really, I'm, I'm blank. Mm -hmm. I think the only way from my point of view that is really through social norms and through the social network. So this is the only way that I think that, that we could really kind of uh, try to engage into that. Mm -hmm. there's a, I think there's a direct comment to that, um, um, or is that a question? If, if it's a question, I would hand over to Paolo, who was her first in raising his hand, and then I would uh, take the questions from the chat, if that is okay. Okay. Um, I would like to move the, the, the question, or the, let's say the, the level of the discussion, to another level. Um, and that has to do with the centralized versus decentralized system. Mm -hmm. And that has to do, at least uh, 
from, from some perspective with the supply uh, security versus outer key. Mm -hmm. And this might be an additional element that can play a role. So I don't think that uh, the level of information in this respect uh, is high enough. Uh, and so that, so that many people may hesitate because they say, okay, uh, what happens when there is not enough sun? What happens when there is not? And that has to do then Mm -hmm. with the grid stability and in turn, you know, the system uh, enlarges the scale. So mm -hmm. I think the two elements are somehow related. And I don't know whether this uh, was an element, an external boundary condition of forcing that you might have included or doesn't play any role. Mm -hmm. Not being an expert, I'm simply asking and maybe it's a naive and stupid question. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a very pertinent question. And, and I know at least I, we, we didn't look into, into that or not yet at least. I know that uh, there is a, a study in, in Wallenstadt. So I think in Wallenstadt, they're trying really to become kind of energy sufficient regions. I know that uh, from ETH, someone is, is also working very closely uh, with them. So we are currently engaging in, in a study also on this acceptance and network and information flows uh, together with several areas. So we are linking up with Wesen and with uh, Tockenburg and with Yves Le Mans, so across and also with the Italian speaking part of Switzerland in order to better understand these processes, but we have not engaged in that. But I, I agree with you, it could be an important motivating factor at some point that, uh, that people would like to uh, maybe either are scared or would love to be in such a, such a self-sufficient commune. And that would actually require social innovation from my point of view, that means new type of governance systems. How, how do you deal with the, when there's not sufficient uh, um, electricity, for example, who will get it? Uh, and all these things have, uh, to my knowledge, not, I, I don't know to which extent they have been put in place or they are being put in place, but it's a super interesting aspect. If you don't have these governance structures in place, there will be no development in that direction and will require a lot of trust. I trust my neighbors to not use my energy. And this might be not so easy to achieve. Yeah, in this example of Wallenstadt, the, I, th I think the idea was really trading, doing kind of micro tradings of energy that you produce and others might require to put this kind of an, on, on an economic model and to have better distribution of what, what people consume and when they consume. Um, I, I, I thought that was a very interesting experiment. Um, there's maybe I pick up the, the question from, from Agiris in the chat. Uh, Hi, Claudia, you showed the unwillingness of people to reduce their living area, even if the household number decreases. Modern policies, however, are asking for a reduction of living area per person, regardless of household situations. How do you see this dynamic moving forward? Thanks a lot for, for that question. So I will answer and then I see that Anna is here who is doing the housing study. So I might also ask her to, to contribute to, to this. I can kind of give a high level discussion. Maybe she can give some inputs from her detailed research. So um, actually how, hmm. If we would take now Corona, I would say, and Anna, you can correct me afterwards, that now the demand for more space uh, is, is actually increasing again. So we might have had a, a, a point where we could think it might be turning towards less um, a living area or reduction of the living area. But uh, I honestly, my, my hypothesis, I doubt that it will be put forward in Switzerland unless you really put it with punishment and, and, and different kind of uh, taxes and so on. Mm, the only way that you could contrast it from my point of view is really with this housing perspective, trying to fulfill the needs of the people of what they need in a, in a different way. But maybe Anna, you want to compliment. Yes, happy to, thank you very much, Claudia. I think it's an excellent question, actually. Um, so one, as Claudia was saying, needs to take into account the multiple layers and multiple um, system elements that are at stake. So on the one hand, is it sustainable to say a force a tenant to move? This would be a first question. And that depends on how we define sustainability. So it's very important, for example, the attachment to a certain dwellings when the children uh, leave for elder elderly, and even the gérance or technische Verwaltung tend not to impose on, on elderly who have been living for a long time in the same dwelling to force them to move. Of course, cooperatives do so. They're controlling the occupancy of their dwelling by uh, pushing them to move when, when uh, the size of their household is, uh, is reduced. But this is the second layer. There are not enough small dwellings. 
So even if we wanted to relocate all the people that were moving around and that want more and more to live alone to a dwelling of an appropriate size, there wouldn't be enough small dwellings. And we are doing some simulations with agent-based modeling now to see what, what would happen if the average size um, of dwellings on the market were 1.5 rooms, what would happen? And we're seeing, let's say, oh, how, how the square meters, how the, the space consumption changes based on these questions. But again, there is a very strong also ethical question on the top, which I was confronted actually quite often. Do we really want to push tenants to move, especially in a market that has 2.7% of vacancy rate? So we're talking about extremely small vacancy rate and finding an apartment takes quite a long time. If the owner will say, OK, I relocate you to another dwelling, so you, you are willing to downsize. I offer you a dwelling that fulfills exactly your function, like a sustainable small status symbol, if that is your desire, or a permanent place because you have still around the same community that you had before, then very welcome. <laughs> and that is, let's say, what we're investigating with Daudia. I think maybe to comment on that, <clears throat> I think there could be an interesting synergy so so switzerland is is actually pioneering in new forms of of living um of mm -hmm. joint living like cluster living for example multi-generational living and i was wondering if you could convince people to change their, their living mode especially as they become older towards these new forms i mean just this multi-generational living i mean i i could just for my naive view i could see this attractive for for a certain uh, part of the population that maybe has the, the children's left their apartment 10 years ago and they, they're actually living in much, much uh, large spaces. Mm -hmm. If I can jump in into this, we also simulated multi-generational dwellings in our agent-based model because APZ, for example, does this. It, they propose like the 50 plus uh, uh, dwellings in which they mix different people. But for example, um, this also needs work from architects because during the COVID we did this uh, think tank on housing and there are people who don't want to share. They, they, they feel like they want to have their own space and, and it's also very difficult. How, how would you convince them? And perhaps instead of convincing them, we think about, yeah, the kind of cluster housing. So the private space where they can be on their own and other shared activities where perhaps you rent it. So you can also be alone in that other area. So it's a big work for architects to rethink about strategies because convincing people also for sharing, not very easy path. Yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. But it also needs the real estate perspective. I mean, you pointed it out, right? I mean, it's just there's a, a dramatic gap uh, in 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 offerings for smaller forms of living. I mean, it's you have a very conservative real estate model that just propagates a, a standard of a family of of apartments that has been developed 50 years ago, right? So it's 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 again this kind of multi junction problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but by now we have met micro houses almost in front of my door in where I live close by to Zurich. So we will see how that uh, emerges. If these micro houses, that, that is something that, that could work out because, you know, it's something that you own by yourself or that is your own house and people tend to want their own house, but it's so small that maybe that could fulfill their, their different needs. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I, I pick up uh, another question from the chat that is related to the, the storage question we discussed earlier. How is mm -hmm. the issue about energy management enabled largely by ICT tech or smart tech and even AI or data-driven approaches poised to manage demand and supply of the energy in both building level and regional ones? Obviously, energy storage plays a key role. So, so the, the role of smart technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, this is what, what I said before. So we have now a, a project ongoing, uh, and it's actually a large uh, project. It's a paket antrag. It's called like that with with the DFG. So it's kind of a large synergy with six different uh, research groups where we are trying to make uh, the energy model for Germany or more something in that direction. And there, actually, the the uh, the um, I see and the AI play an important role regarding the flexibility. So how can I have the technical flexibility, but then I have the real flexibility? And and we are trying to evaluate when uh, during the day could this flexibility occur and obviously energy storage will be a key issue and there technology has to be put in place and afterwards obviously the investment of people in in storage will be essential but uh, but i agree this will be a key for the energy transition as soon as we have solved that i, I guess the, all the issues will almost disappear very good additional questions from the audience now's your your time. If not, uh, I would uh, 
like to thank you very much, Claudia. That was very interesting. Um, great presentation and, uh, and a lot of insights. Thank you for the audience for joining on a beautiful evening. And I wish you all the best uh, for the rest of the evening. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thanks for hosting me and all the best. Goodbye. All the best. Bye-bye.